Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 207. This week the questions are taken from guide 252, that's the guide on the French ship Henri IV, and the Wednesday video on the Battle of the Falkland Islands in World War One. Philip Rooks asks, the German armoured cruisers seem to have lasted fairly long against superior and much more modern battle cruisers who expended a lot of their main ammunition stock to sink the German cruisers. What was the reason for this? Was it qual quality of the British shells, poor gunnery, sturdy German ships or a combination thereof? There's a combination of factors but the two main ones were firstly that the two British battle cruisers were suffering somewhat from smoke interference. The way a lot of the battle went. The wind was blowing smoke away from the German cruisers, so they had fairly clear sights on the enemy, whilst the British ships had smoke interfering with their gunnery. The only gun that doesn't seem to have suffered from that was Invincible's forward gun, because it was the forwardmost gun of all of the guns in the British battle cruiser force, but everything else had significant levels of smoke interference for good chunks of the battle. The other thing, which is something that people don't perhaps necessarily appreciate, is that there are two components to the modern fire control systems that had developed in the 1900s and 1910s and which would go on to dominate, obviously, the major battles of World War One and all of World War Two, with the exception of occasionally where radar was involved. One of which, the optical rangefinder, had started out in the very beginning of the 1900s, but the other of which, the director control table director control tower whatever you want to call it fire control table basically the electromechanical computer that actually works out the ranges and gives you your range and bearings that came a bit later and the two british battle cruisers present at the falklands didn't have that installed yet prototype units had begun to be fitted around about 1910-1911 in the fleet but for obvious reasons, the latest ships that were just completing tended to be the ones that were fitted with them. Now, as far as I'm aware, in 1914, the only British battle cruiser that was actually in service and fitted with a fire control director table was HMS Queen Mary. Invincible and various other I-type battle cruisers were refitted in 1915, so by the time of the Battle of Jutland, we can talk about them with director for control firing, but at the time of the Battle of the Falkland Islands, both sides, uh, the Germans and the British, were using optical rangefinders only. Now, obviously, the rangefinder gives a much better way of shooting at long distance than just the Mark I human eyeball, but without that centralised ability to plot and mechanically calculate distances, accuracy is going to be significantly lower. So you think of all the various points in different engagements in World War II, once you'd lost your director fire control systems or communications with them, and how dramatically that affected various ships' accuracies, even if their gun turrets themselves might have had, let's say, rangefinders that were significantly superior to the nine-foot rangefinders on Invincible at the time, they still struggled to hit anything at considerable range. And of course, the British battle cruisers were attempting to stay out of the range at which the Shan Horse had any chance of harming them whatsoever. So they were fighting at a reasonably long range and with only kind of half of what we think of as a modern dreadnought type fire control system enabled. Christopher Babylon asks, in your opinion, what was Admiral von Spee's best option? Realistically, von Spee doesn't have a lot of good options. He is faced with the fact that wherever he stays put, he's going to eventually be surrounded and overwhelmed by a superior British force. And his only real paths back home involve either going round Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, and then trying to break through the North Sea blockade, possibly with the entirety of the battlecruiser fleet and the Grand Fleet waiting for him, because battlecruisers would get back first. Or he could try a mad dash up the, up the channel. That's almost certainly not going to work, because, well, there's a lot of troop transport movements and supply movements going on in the channel, and there's a bunch of pre-dreadnoughts and various cruisers there, and it's a narrow 
environment, so there's not anywhere to evade. Or he could try and break into the Mediterranean and replicate the run of Goban and Breslau over to the Ottomans. So of the three options, as I said, the channel is pretty much out. Doing a Mediterranean run relies on getting past Gibraltar, and Gibraltar's shore defences are more than capable of hurting him, and the range is short enough they really will. Um, but assuming maybe he could afford to sneak through at night, maybe at like two in the morning, and make a flat-out run across, he's then got to dodge the French Navy, elements of the Royal Navy, and possibly even the Italians, to get to the Dardanelles. Could it be done? Maybe. Very much maybe. He, unlike Goban and Breslau, he doesn't have the advantage of an overall speed advantage, so he could be intercepted. But if he manages to wrong foot the British battlecruisers, bearing in mind Princess Royals in the Caribbean, and you've got um, two battlecruisers in the Falklands, so he might pull it off. The chances of interception, though, are very high. Which means that, believe it or not, his best bet might actually be to try and break into the North Sea and make a run for home. Now, he does have a, a little bit of a wild card in this, in that there are a couple of German colonies in the western side of Africa, which he could stop by at for refueling, cleaning his ships, and maybe some basic maintenance to his engines, which obviously otherwise would be a significant problem. So, Theoretically, his best bet would maybe be to make a run for those. Namibia is just about still, or German Southwest Africa as it is at the time, is still just about in German hands at the end of 1914. So he could stop there. He could head up for the other uh, Western German colony, to again, for replenishment. And assuming that word doesn't get out of this, um, and he's not tracked down almost immediately, then he could try and make a hopeful run up the centre of the Atlantic and then maybe try and blockade run the North Sea blockade. It basically comes down to how good is British intelligence and how lucky is von Spee because if British intelligence works out what he's doing, he's doomed. He'll be intercepted by multiple battle cruisers. If he's unlucky, he's doomed. If you know a merchant ship spots his forces and radios in and our merchant cruiser, basically any British or ship or any ship that reports his presence at all and he'll, again, be met by squadrons of battle cruisers. But if he can somehow thread his way up the Atlantic via the element of surprise, then the ships that are ordinarily on the blockade won't be able to stop him. And then it's a question of, once he trips that wire of going through the blockade and starts steaming at full speed south, can the British scramble forces whether they be the Harwich Force, the battle cruisers, or whatever, and what speed is von Spray capable of going at that point in order to intercept him in the North Sea before he either reaches the safety of German minefields or maybe, maybe the Germans come out to escort him in. The latter is probably fairly unlikely, though, because if von Spey in any way, shape, or form manages to coordinate, that means he's going to have to use radio, which means the British will be know about it. Which, weirdly enough, if they pretend not to know about it, and obviously there's no particular reason Von Spey might think they would, um, but if they do know about it and the Germans send out, say, for a scouting group or something to you know, meet him and bring him back in, not the high seas fleet because that would slow him down, um, then that could actually create a Battle of Dogger Bank early version uh, type in battle where... Various British armoured and battle cruisers might end up mixing up with Von Spey's squadron and the early version of First Scouting Group, which could be an interesting alternate history. Random Guy asks, Seeing the huge death tolls at the Battle of the Falkland Islands, how many more men do you think could have been saved if it had been a warmer time of the year? Unfortunately, it's going to only make the difference in the matter of maybe half a dozen to a dozen more men if that, because whilst obviously this encounter takes place towards the end of 1914, we've got to remember the Falklands is a very far south away from the equator, so it's not exactly a warm environment any time of the year, but it's also being in the south southern hemisphere the other way around to us in the northern hemisphere. So believe it or not, December is one of the warmest months 
the average sea temperature in December is about a degree to a degree and a half cooler than it would be in January, February, which is the warmest month for sea temperature. But it's still pretty darn cold. Um, if you look into what for us is the middle of summer, August-ish, the sea temperature has halved, if not more, from the December sea temperature. So basically, if the fight had taken place at the very beginning of 1915, then there's a small possibility that, let's say, a half dozen, a dozen more men might have lasted just long enough to be picked up but it'll be marginal and basically outside of December through February the casualties would have been even greater. James D asks if von Spee had through the efforts of some deity made it through to Germany what use would his ships have been to the high seas fleet in later operations? Odd as it might sound his smaller ships the light cruisers would have been far more useful because if you look at the order of battle at say Jutland you'll notice the British are swimming in light cruisers or light armoured cruisers or whatever you want to call them, but you get the idea. Um, the Germans, on the other hand, aren't, and von Spee had some of the better German light cruisers. So if he'd had those and got them all the way back to Germany, well, that's a, another three cruisers added to the German fleet screen, which would actually be a substantial increase in the total German cruiser-based fleet screen, uh, which would be quite nice, the armoured cruisers would be less useful. Now, that's on two grounds. One is that, well, the German armoured cruiser force by 1916, let's say the Battle of Jutland period, had been completely decimated. A good number of them had been sunk, obviously including Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, but even if we assume they survive, Almost all their predecessors have been sunk, and the literally one or two others that are still around are either, in the case of First Bismarck, being coastal defence vessels, or in the case of one or two of the later survivors like Rune, they don't really have a place in the fleet engagements anymore because they are too slow. Um, even the absolute latest predecessors to the Scharnhorst can just about keep up with the German battle line, the older ones can't, they'd be outpaced, and, um, well, the Scharnhorst were the first German armoured cruisers that were in any way, shape or form significantly faster than the High Seas Fleet battle line. So the Scharnhorst, while they probably would have utility in and of themselves within the High Seas Fleet, they would be on their own. They wouldn't be leading a force of armoured cruisers in the way that there were one or two armoured cruiser units in the Grand Fleet. The other part of it is that armoured cruisers really had pretty much had their day by 1916 in terms of fleet engagements, period, as First Cruiser Squadron would kind of demonstrate. But given the their speed was respectable once they'd been refitted, etc., and reconditioned in Germany, the two Scharnhorst might have made a decent sort of force lead for the High Seas Fleet's main cruiser units, i.e., something for them to fall back on, something to be a flagship. They're probably just about fast enough to keep up um, with their charges and just about fast enough to get away if, uh, you know, things that aren't battle cruisers come hunting for them. Jason Douglas asks, in Ken Burns' series on the American Civil War, they mentioned the fact that a US naval ship attacked and defeated a Japanese warship that was harassing European merchant ships in the area. Could you tell us more about this? So what he is probably referring to is the Battle of Shimonoseki. Now, this starred USS Wyoming, which you can see here, which had originally sailed out, if you can believe it, to find and intercept CSS Alabama. Um, yeah, at that mission, let's just say they didn't fulfill that one. Um, instead, they wound up in Japan. And there they found that in the decline of the shogunate and the rise of uh, traditional imperial power, there was a clash between the emperor and the shogunate. The shogunate had opened Japan. Uh, the emperor didn't think this was a good idea. He had ordered the Japanese to expel what he termed the barbarians. And one of the clans, the Chosu, I think they're pronounced, had decided that they were going to uh, rather enthusiastically embrace this. And they had a small navy that was made up of three steam vessels that, that ironically enough, of all things, had been bought from the Americans. 
and some coastal batteries, and they just started shooting at any foreign vessel that showed up in their area of control. Um, everybody had gotten rather annoyed with this. Wyoming was the closest Western warship, apart from a 16-gun Dutch warship that had been fired on earlier. Uh, Wyoming was a somewhat larger and somewhat more capable vessel than the, the Dutch ship, which was just, as I say, a 16-gunner. Whilst Wyoming herself was just a sloop and carried even fewer guns, what she did carry were some fairly hefty guns, including 11-inch Dahlgrens. And so she sailed into the Straits, um, intent on engaging the Japanese ships, and promptly ran aground because, uh, well, they didn't have any charts for those waters, and it turns out they were relatively shallow in areas. Um, having then run aground, and already having fought some of the shore batteries, the Japanese warships came out to meet them, uh, or to meet the US ship, and this is where something that you'll see recurring quite a bit during early battles between steamships that didn't have armour in the 1850s and 1860s occurs, which is, you know, the big shell guns are capable of punching straight through the hull, combined with the fact the funnel gives you a rather easy point to aim at, combined with the fact that early steam engines are very large and therefore tend to come up above the waterline, um, the first Japanese ship that was coming in ended up taking a couple of hits to its boilers, and the boilers exploded, and that was it for that ship. The Wyoming then managed to get itself off of the sandbanks and uh, sail up and damage one of the other Japanese ships, sinking the second one of the remaining two, and then decided, right, well, we've won the battle clearly, so we can head off and get ourselves repaired. It's a victory, obviously, for the Americans tactically, but since the shore batteries were still intact, the Wyoming had to withdraw um, for repairs, and then the Japanese would eventually salvage the other two ships. Although it, did, it put an end to Japanese marauding by the Chosu clan for a short while, until those vessels could be salvaged, but later on, um, I believe it was later that year, and then in the following year, so this is 1863, and then obviously in 1864, the various powers that had interests in trading with Japan, so Britain, France, the Netherlands, all of which, and the, the United States, all but the UK having had ships fired upon by the Chosu earlier, um, all basically ganged up and went in with much heavier forces against the Chosu clan, and that managed to quell the issue somewhat more permanently. Kurumi asks, why did the Japanese go for a two-front, three-back arrangement for the Amagis, Tosas, and Keys compared to the three-front, two-back arrangement for the Miyokos, Takaos, Megamis, and Ibukis? It basically comes down to weight and hull design. So, although obviously eight-inch guns weigh a reasonable amount, the turrets on Japanese cruisers were not particularly heavily protected, and you know, even if you look at other vessels like the Brooklyns, where the turrets were somewhat better protected, still, the overall weight of the turret is significantly less proportionally as compared to the weight of uh, what is obviously going to be an extremely heavily armoured 16-inch twin turret on something like uh, an Amagi Tosa or Key. And so when you're looking at it from that perspective, if you have three turrets right forward in in an arrangement like uh, an Ata Atago or Takao, as you can see here, that's going to concentrate a huge amount of weight up forward, which is going to make the ship incredibly badly trimmed, which is going to cause significant issues with sea keeping. You'll notice that the all forward turret design ships like Nelson, for example, if you're going to have three turrets or more forward, you tend to move the superstructure far back, which counteracts the trim issues and also means the main guns are, can be slightly further back, more towards amidships. Um, or, in the case of something like Richelieu, you only have a pair of turrets. Same with Dunkirk. So, it's a, there's a weight balance issue going on. The other issue is in terms of hull form, because with cruisers, obviously you want high speed. Fair enough, the Japanese with the Amagis, Tosas and Keys also wanted high speed, but on a cruiser, you tend to have a fairly narrow length to beam ratio, and most of the hull form's size, shape, etc. is dictated by that desire for speed and cruising efficiency. So if you want to make the hull relatively long, 
and therefore have a fairly wide beam or full width of beam going down most of the length of the ship, which then enables you to have more weaponry forward, which is ideally where you want it, then that will work on a cruiser. Whereas on a battleship or battle cruiser, more so on a battleship than a battle cruiser, but still on both, because you have significant protection to take account of deck armor and belt armor, you want to minimize your citadel space as much as possible. And if you're going to do that, you not only have to minimize the length, but you also have to look at the overall hull width because deck armor, as I've mentioned before, despite being much thinner than uh, belt armor, it ends up in many cases actually weighing as much, if not quite, quite often more than the belt armor because it has to cover a much, much greater surface area. And so in order to reduce the overall weight of the armor, the hull considerations of a battleship or battle cruiser are much more slated towards weight saving or weight reduction than a cruiser's is. And in that case, it tends to work out that not only have you got the weight and the trim issue, but it's actually also more efficient to put more turrets aft because ideally you need to get your bow going from a fairly narrow point, obviously, at the front. You want it to flare relatively quickly i.e be a relatively short bow area then continue down the ship and then start narrowing but when you're narrowing aft you've got the machinery and the propeller shafts to take into account so if you look at sort of your balance point where the funnels and superstructure are on a typical battleship especially one that's designed for a bit more speed you actually tend to have more space aft than you do forwards and this is speaking in terms of full width or near full width parts of the hull not the entire length of the hull plus of course in all three of the cases you mentioned the margis toasters and keys they're also taking advantage of the near enough amidships positions for the guns the same way that uh, british battle cruisers and the 13.5 inch british battleships did because of, again that's a full width part of the hull and one of the many reasons why you don't want to put a main gun turret in an area of the hull that is narrower than the full width beam or close to it is shock effects from underwater explosives um, as a amongst various other things so you, you can look at say the incident where north carolina was torpedoed and how close that came to setting off the main magazines if she'd had a third turret forward instead of the turret aft and they hadn't shoved everything back to compensate then the width of hull where the magazine would have been for the forwardmost turret would have been considerably narrower which would have made it sub more subject to the blast effects which would have possibly lent to it detonating and well underwater explosives was something that any dreadnought had to take account of although obviously world war one uh dreadnoughts tended to take account of it slightly less than interwar and war world war ii designs conocor asks in spite of having 26 army marshals, Napoleon ever named one Admiral of France, Murat. Why was the Napoleonic French Navy so neglected, and why was no effort ever truly undertaken to improve their situation versus the British? Well, there are probably books to be written on that whole situation, but the short version is a mixture of the fact that, well, Napoleon was interested firstly in the conquest of Europe, um, and then later other parts near Europe and for that he needed an army so obviously the army was going to be his main focus he of course also was a former army officer the French navy although the as the French royal navy it had had a number of successes against the British royal navy and it had held its own in a few battles it had still broadly speaking been on a bit of a losing streak for about a century so compared to the french army which had been somewhat more successful it naturally therefore the french army attracted a bit more attention um mostly it is just the, the campaigns in europe attracting far more of france's interest and revenue uh, but the other factor that you have to consider is that when it comes to officers and i have made this point before it takes an lot 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 longer to train a good captain or a good admiral 
than it does to for a navy than it does to train a good captain or a good general for an army uh, apart from anything at least with an army in the napoleonic period at least you have don't have to worry about the ground giving way beneath your feet or the ground suddenly trying to kill you um, etc and so on the ground is a relatively speaking static environment barring the occasional quagmire caused by rain whereas you know at sea you're not just as a captain commanding the men under you you're also commanding a ship which is one of the most technologically advanced pieces of hardware in existence in the late 18th early 19th century and you're in an environment that wants you very 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 dead um, and you have to sort out your own means of propulsion as well plus even for a frigate captain you're probably in charge of an artillery battery that would be the envy of most european armies in any given field engagement and as a result given that in both the French army and the French navy, the higher echelons tended to be aristocratic and the revolution had executed a good chunk of them, it would take an awful lot longer just to get the other officers who were then coming up the ranks up to speed and up to skill as compared to the effort it would take in the army. And of course that means you know shorter term gains are better realised in the army than in the navy. That's not to say the French navy in the napoleonic era didn't have any competent officers they did have some but unfortunately usually they ended up either being frigate officers which could attain relatively decent degrees of success in and of themselves but obviously not in a position to out, in, out influence the outcome of any major war or they tended for a variety of reasons to be second in commands of major fleets and then either obviously get dragged down by less competent senior officers or just flat out killed in battle by the circumstances caused by their less competent senior officers um, as i've said a few times before rear admiral magon of the french fleet at the battle of trafalgar if he had been in command 99.9 percent .9 would have done a much much better job than villeneuve um but Villeneuve was in charge and Magon wasn't and Magon ended up being killed at Trafalgar so he didn't get a chance to go for round two. The Black Nid asks, what can you tell us about HMS Scourge versus the Sans Culotte? I just found a print of the painting of the two ships and there doesn't seem to be much information about them. So this combat took place within a few days of Britain and France declaring war on each other again in 1793. It's a bit of an interesting one, but the information available on the ships themselves, as you mentioned, is quite scarce because these are two very small ships um, to the point that, you know, there are a lot of ships of about this size that just flat out don't rate any significant mention in the history books. The fact that it's the first fight of this particular war and it's a somewhat unequal fight, but with the underdog coming out the winner is the main reason why we even really know much about the ships at all. So Sans Culotte was a fairly typical French privateer dash raider, so not, as you can see, officially flying the flag of the French Navy, but still out there to raid British shipping and uh, allies of Britain and make themselves a little bit of a fortune. She's mildly well-armed, she's about a dozen guns all, to all told, but you know that's that's enough to overwhelm the average merchant ship and that's really about it i mean you can immediately tell by that even against a sixth rate she is badly badly um underarmed but as a privateer she doesn't need to take on full-fledged warships then you have the scourge now the scourge is a brig sloop so as you can see it's got two masts um, it's not a rated ship of the line. It's officially a, well, it's a brig. It's not a sixth rate. It's officially rated for 16 guns. So it technically on paper has a firepower advantage over the Sans Culotte. However, because the war came as something of a surprise to the Royal Navy, not entirely, but a little bit, there was, Scourge was basically put to sea to intercept the first wave of French raiders before she was actually anywhere close to ready so she only had about just over three quarters of her actual uh, crew aboard that she should have had so she was undermanned 
Uh, she was also hilariously undergunned. She only actually had, because she was being fitted out when she was kicked out to sea, she didn't have enough supplies on board for a long voyage. She also only had six guns out of her 16, which meant that actually when she ran into Sanskalot, she was lesser, less well armed. Uh, they were also lighter guns, just the, the Sanskalot guns. Um, so, yeah, so you have the ship that's undermanned, underarmed, and is also, as you can see in this painting, physically the smaller vessel. And it comes across this French privateer. Now, if she'd been fully manned and if she'd been fully gunned, then Scourge should have won a reasonably comfortable victory over the Sans Culotte. She could stay at range, um, bombard the Sans Culotte with superior firepower until enough of the Sans Culotte's crew were down to either justify a boarding action or to make the ship strike her colours. But as it turned out, the Frenchmen, realising they had a bigger ship, more guns and more men, decided to try and press the action, which is what you can see going on in the painting. And it was a very close run thing. It, the battle ran for quite some time. Uh, so I think it was about two and a half to three hours. And the French ship repeatedly tried to board the Scourge unsuccessfully. Um until eventually the Scourge managed to force the surrender of the Sans Culotte, mainly due to the fact that there were, believe it or not, given the, you know, the length of time and the ferocity of the battle, relatively few casualties on the British ship. Barely anyone had died, only a few were wounded. The French had considerably more dead and considerably more wounded, when, although bear in mind, given that we're not talking ship, first rate ships of the line here, you're talking about maybe two dozen give or take killed and wounded total across both ships um, but that's enough to for the French to see a significant disadvantage developing and then they strike their colours, Scourge brings Sans Culotte into port and it's celebrated as both an underdog victory and the first, first naval engagement of the war so yeah that's the potted history of that engagement Edward Dunn asks, you may have already covered something along these lines before, but you've often mentioned the British 15-inch 42, the American 14-inch 50, the Russian 12-inch 52, and the Italian 15-inch 50, when it hits, are some of the best heavy naval guns of all time, obviously when working properly. What are some of the worst guns for the Dreadnought era onwards? I imagine that some of the early British 12-inch 50 guns would feature somewhere on the list, but are there any others? Well, there are a lot of guns that can be considered to be pretty terrible in the Dreadnought era and onwards, but some of them are down to the guns themselves, and some of them are actually more down to the mountings and the way those guns are used. So, for example, as you said, the 12-inch 50 caliber gun that the British developed, yeah, not a good gun. Not particularly brilliant in terms of range, fairly inaccurate, it was basically a waste of time um it didn't in the end offer all that much better performance and worse accuracy than the 12 inch 45s that were on earlier and rapidly were superseded by the 13.5 inch gun now another example of a poor weapon in the dreadnought era would be the deutschland's 11 inch guns you know, okay they're fine for dealing with the odd cruiser but they are basically not they're not 100 identical but performance wise they're basically comparable to 11 inch guns from the start of the first world war also found on german ships and as such if they came up against anything with any kind of substantial armor protection they would be in trouble i mean even something like say uh, uss wichita which is obviously a heavy cruiser but a relatively well protected heavy cruiser does have a certain amount of immunity zone against the Deutschland class at longer ranges. Um, not a huge amount, but and certainly not something I'd want to you know bet my life on. But if it's correctly angled, there is that small margin. And of course, anything with any substantial armor, battle cruisers and battleships would be able to resist it. So yeah, it's. It's not a good weapon. It could have been significantly improved. And of course, the 11-inch guns on the Scharnhorst were significantly improved over those on the Deutschlands. But then you have other guns, like, say, the 
the um, guns that the Soviets tried to put on the Kirovs, that being the a cruiser of the 1930s, not the uh, more modern ship, you know, they ended up being underpowered and hilariously slow to reload initially as a concept they're not a particularly good one but they were made somewhat better later on because this is I'm going to say where the issue comes about when it's more the mountings and other systems surrounding the gun that drag it down now, as I said that, that Kirov's guns are not particularly brilliant in and of themselves anyway but there is certainly a lot better than their performance initially on trials and in the first few years of their service, which is usually where that gun performance matters, would otherwise suggest. Likewise, the British 4.7-inch gun, as found quite often on destroyers and sometimes on larger ships, is not a terrible anti-aircraft weapon, um, but it's dragged down quite a bit by the mountings that were developed for it. When it was actually put in high-angle mountings, it proved to be a reasonably successful high-angle weapon, perhaps a little bit too overpowered for the role, making the whole thing a bit heavy. Um, but it certainly was a somewhat better gun in that role than it's usually given credit for as a gun. As I say, you know, in, in the whole system of low-angle mountings and mountings with limited at maximum elevation where they're supposed to be dual-purpose, it's a fairly poor weapon system for anti-aircraft use, um, but the gun itself isn't bad. Then you have something like, again, the, the main armament of the Corvair-class battleships. It's a 12-inch gun, there's nothing particularly to write home about it, but it's an absolutely terrible weapon system, because at least initially the elevation on the French main battery turrets is so terrible, as something I've pointed out several times before, that the secondary battery outranges the main change that and it's not not an awful weapon system it's not a particularly brilliant gun but it's an okay gun um but in the context of the gun as a weapon system including the turret and its mountings it, it becomes poor and you also have something like say the 16 inch guns on nelson and rodney now granted the lightweight super fast shell concept turned out to be a little bit of a dead end but the performance of the guns themselves is a little bit better than is often given credit for. Yes, the ships had huge amounts of problems with their guns, but again, this was more down to the mountings and more specifically the various changes and slimming downs and cost cuttings and literal structure cuttings that had to be done to get what was going to be the G3's gun mountings down to a weight where you could fit it on a 35,000 ton battleship. Once all those problems are either fixed or mostly set aside and you look at the actual performance of the guns in and of themselves they perform actually better than their reputation might suggest well apart from anything just ask bismarck how good they those 16 inch shells can perform and you know e even compared to their on paper stats they generally seem in the one or two engagements where they're actually engaging anything substantial in terms of resistance they do seem to slightly overperform compared to their reputation but in the 1920s, as a weapon system, they have a laundry list of items which are wrong with them. Brendan Boersdorf asks, What's the largest gun ever considered for placement on a cruiser? And would it have been feasible, or was it just a pipe dream? Well, it depends what you classify as a cruiser, because technically the v Japanese B-65 class are super cruisers, and eventually they were looking at maybe sticking 14-inch guns on them. Of course, you've got the Alaskas with 12-inch guns. The Invincibles are originally a form of armoured cruiser, and they have 12-inch guns. So you could say the 12-inch gun, or possibly conceptually, because they weren't built, the 14-inch gun is the largest gun for placement on a cruiser. But, you know, again, super cruisers, battle cruisers, do they really count? Um... As far as something that is most definitively a cruiser and proportionally, almost certainly holds the record, here's the Matsushima class. These things clock in at just over 4,000 tons, and yes, that is a 12.6 inch can, a battleship grade cannon strapped to the front. Uh, two of them had them on the front, one, at the, one had it on the back, and there was a fourth one that was supposed to have it on the back, but by that point they'd realised this was a silly idea. And, yeah, believe it or not, this was a Je Nicole-inspired idea to effectively create a 
pre-dreadnought except well a pre-dreadnought's firepower in a conga line of protected cruisers and no i'm not kidding um it turned out to be a horrifically bad idea um they had the accuracy of a drunken glaswegian given um a rugby ball and a target 300 yards away um and the reload time that could be measured in shots per hour rather than shots per minute but as you can see they were actually built um so technically such a thing was feasible uh, practically it was a, a terrible terrible idea and uh, one of the major reasons why the japanese dropped the genical shortly after the late 19th century edition of the sino-japanese war mr v asks i've always heard that the russian submarines in world war ii were horrible or just something that's been a bit overblown i was wondering is this true and why is this the case Russian submarines efforts in World War II are a little bit of a nightmare to unpick. There are some decent-ish books out there about them, but as with a lot of stuff involving the Soviet Union and World War II, for obvious reasons, a lot of those records were closed off for a long period of time, and then there was a brief window where Western historians could get access to them and do some translation, and then that window was rather violently shoved closed in everybody's faces again. So... You know, um, it's an area that has to be treated with a bit more caution than average. When it comes to the submarines themselves, they vary wildly. Some Russian submarine classes were really, really awful, um, both in technical terms and to serve on. Others were not half bad, actually. There were some that arguably superior to a fair number of the better known classes of subs. However, universally, they suffer from two problems. One is, well, technologically, they are, on average, just a little bit behind everybody else, um, much as a lot of the Soviet Navy was, which is really one of the reasons, for example, why when it came to their surface ships, they were buying in help from Italian designers and so forth, or just in the case of Tashkent, flat out having the ships built in Italian yards. The other thing is is well stalin had brutally shot a good chunk of the upper echelons you how to command a submarine shades of uh, revolutionary france there so the russian submarine arm was suffering from low morale and trying to rebuild all of its um command staff after various late 1930s purges so that's going to affect their operational efficiency and then finally they have the fact that well where are they going to primarily operate the black sea and the baltic which are both relatively short on targets compared to you know the north atlantic or the mediterranean or the western pacific they're much much more enclosed and there's fewer targets there to begin with you know there's not a huge amount of access aligned merchant shipping in either of those areas although there's some um, and there's a fair number of access warships and aircraft so they're operating in a target poor very threat high environment without the benefit of a fairly established and well you know well put together command chain of command with overall a technological level that's a fraction behind everybody else so they do tend to take some rather horrific levels of losses now as i say that doesn't mean that there aren't the occasional successes you put a good commander together with a one of the better submarines and give them a little bit of luck and they can do perfectly well um but there isn't really any comparison even the mediterranean which is usually thought of as a fairly confined environment for submarines has got nothing on operating in the black sea or the baltic for when it comes to uh, threats and uh, confined waters dr d m platt asks how often did units of the battle cruiser fleet go up to scapa flow during world war one for firing practice was 3rd Battle Cruiser Squadron the first to go up in May 1916? And could fire controls teams be swapped between ships? So, in terms of the Battle Cruisers going up to refresh their gunnery practice at Scapa, in the first year and a bit of its existence, basically it didn't happen. Uh, you've got to bear in mind, actually, the Battle Cruiser fleet was 
and their move to Rosyth was only done at the beginning of 1915. So by the time you get to Jutland, it's only, as I said, just been about a year and a quarter or so since that happened. And prior to that point, you had the issue that if you detached a battle cruiser squadron to go up to practice its gunnery separate from the rest of the battle cruiser fleet, that left the rest of the battle cruisers notionally at that's something approximating parity with the first scouting group uh, on a, any given day it might have a two ship superiority or it might be equal or it might even be slightly less depending on who which sides had which ships in for refit at the time and so there wasn't any opportunity to do anything other than stick around in Rosyth and hope for the best then once fifth battle squadron with the queen elizabeth's is formed there is an opportunity to swap out uh, one of the battle cruiser squadrons, so third battle cruiser squadron goes up for gunnery practice, and that's when Jutland happens. You have first and second battle cruiser squadrons plus fifth battle squadron uh, in the battle cruiser fleet, and then third battle cruiser squadron is attached to the grand fleet. So yeah, the third battle cruiser squadron is the first one to go up in in May 1916 to try and sort out some long distance fire control practice. As far as could fire control teams be swapped between ships? Um, theoretically, yes. But the if you're swapping an exceptional fire team into a new ship for them, um, as opposed to a new ship in terms of production, their effectiveness will be somewhat reduced. Because for one thing, they you may be moving them to a ship with a completely different gun setup. So if you move them from a 12-inch ship to a 13.5-inch ship or a 15-inch ship or back down the line. But even if you're moving them to a ship which it has the same caliber of gun, there are two different flavors of 13.5-inch gun. There's a couple, there's a few different flavors of 12-inch gun. Fortunately, there's only one flavor of 15-inch gun. But if we're talking about, in again, given the context of the question, World War One you also have a complete range of fire control systems for them to get used to. So, you know, if are you on the one ship that has an Argo pollen clock? Are you on a ship with a Dumeresque? And if you do have a Dumeresque, which version of the Dumeresque do you have? And then if you do happen to have a fire control table, well, either a Dumeresque or an Argo clock, whichever one happens to be on board, you might not have one on board, but if you do, then what rangefinders do you have attached? Do you have a, a six foot rangefinder, a nine foot rangefinder, a 15 foot rangefinder, or some other dimension of rangefinder? And how many rangefinders are there? Where are they? What, how accurate are they? What's the, uh, what, what is the accuracy of the data that's being given to you? So all of these things, a good fire control team would learn to manage aboard their ship. But since almost every ship in the Royal Navy is going to be somewhat different, even ones ostensibly within the same class, yeah, you could transfer them to another ship, but their effectiveness would drop until they could get used to what this new ship was like. So even if you had, you know, an elite fire control team, like, say, on HMS Invincible at Jutland, even if you transferred them to Indefatigable before the battle, uh, in, and somehow persuaded everyone this was a good idea, Indefatigable's gunnery might have gotten a bit better, but it wouldn't have gotten as good as Invincible's was because, well, apart from I think the fire control team isn't the entirety of the system. You've also got the gunnery team in the turrets and so forth. But also Indefatigable being an Indefatigable class battle cruiser as opposed to Invincible being an Invincible class will have slightly different systems. Clayton Bradish asks, in World War II, which capital ship was recorded sunk most often when in fact it was not? It seems like a two-ship race between Warspite and Enterprise. I don't know for certain. Um, maybe someone in the comments does. But I would suspect it's probably Enterprise. Yorktown and Ark Royal were both reported sunk numerous times, but, of course, eventually they were sunk. I think probably in terms of official claims to have sunk a vessel when it hadn't. I, I have a distinct feeling Ark Royal might have been the winner because the Germans were really determined to have claimed to have sunk her in the first couple of years of the war. But by the classification of your question, she was eventually sunk and so doesn't count. Um, Warspite and Enterprise were both claimed to have been sunk numerous times. 
But given that German efforts against war spite were slightly fewer and far between as compared to Japanese efforts to attack Enterprise, I have a feeling just in my gut that Enterprise was probably claimed sunk by the Japanese more often than the Germans claimed war spite to be sunk. And to be fair to the Japanese, I mean, this is Enterprise taking one of her later hits. Um, if you were a Japanese pilot and you were flying away from that and you know what happened to your carriers at Midway and so forth, I, I can see why you might turn around and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure we sank it that time. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I I'm going to put tentative money on Enterprise, but I await uh, comments from people who might have looked into that in uh, more detail to see what the answer might actually be. The Freaker 86 asks, what exactly made the machinery and the boilers of Prince Eugen so delicate or complicated to operate such that after World War II when the German crew left the ship and the US Navy crew took over, the machinery broke down in quite short order? Did it require special training and skills to operate the machinery? So I've covered this a few times before in the dry dock. Ultimately, it comes down to how the German uh, Kriegsmarine came up with their high-pressure steam machinery. Because, again, as mentioned in various other questions, different navies came up with different ways of dealing with uh, the new advances in machinery. The Royal Navy, for example, preferred to go with a slightly lower pressure but much more reliable system. Uh, the Americans managed to work out how to make a high-pressure reliable system for World War II and used it to their advantage. The Germans also had a high-pressure system, but their high-pressure system was based around, rather than the US one, which was a development of other marine technology, the German one was a system that was developed on land, i.e. in an installation, and it worked fine there, uh, but they introduced... One, lots of boilers, lots of smaller boilers as opposed to a few larger ones, which means more chance for any individual thing to go wrong um, because there's lots of duplicated systems. But secondly, in order to regulate and control everything, there were loads of individual side systems, all of which required complex operation by trained personnel and almost all of which drew on the steam pressure from the main boilers. Now, if you are developing all of this on land, where all of these subsystems can be nicely spaced out with plenty of walkways between them, you've got all the spare parts to hand, and the system's just chugging away quite happily, this is fine. When you try and cram it all into the relatively confined hull of a heavy cruiser, and even though the hippers are pretty large for heavy cruisers, it's still a fairly confined space, um... And then you take into account that the ship is varying its speed quite a bit um, at various points, so the steam pressure is going up and down, um, and of course the whole ship is moving uh, in all dimensions. So that makes you know it makes for a system that's going to break considerably more and present various problems that a land installed, land developed system won't really have shown up. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, obviously with various steam pressures fluctuating and all these other subsystems breaking down there's a lot of proprietary very complicated parts that people can't necessarily fix or understand you might need a very very specific part for one specific subsystem that doesn't exist anywhere else on the ship um you and as i said because of the complexity you might not understand it it may be a case of having to get a specialist in either from some other part of the ship or perhaps even a specialist from ashore and if that system goes down, well, then everything else is going to be working less less accurately, less well, less reliably, and you can end up with cascade failures as one thing after another locks up, which causes another thing to lock up, and then multiply, as I said, multiply that out by the fact there's an awful lot of this machinery as opposed to fewer larger pieces of machinery. So once one thing goes wrong, you can get a horrific cascade failure in short order. It's basically, I would say, the equivalent is, if you imagine trying to keep a high-pressure boiler system working, the American approach, if we liken it to, say, walking a tightrope, the American approach is, okay, maybe the, the tightrope walker 
is a little bit larger than average, but all he's doing is is he's got his you know, his balance bar and maybe a backpack, and he's waltzed out a fairly constant pace across the tightrope, not quite jogging, but that's how he does it. So you know, there's a the individual systems are somewhat larger, but it's a fairly rel relatively speaking simple, reliable point A to point B. So. You then have your German type walk, tightrope walking specialists who've looked at this and gone, yeah, but we don't want to use a tightrope walker who's maybe you know, 120 kilos uh, with a backpack. We're going to use this guy who is uh, maybe 65 kilos when soaking wet um, uh, because he can sprint across the, the tightrope. Except that in order to enable him to do that, he has to have, you know, a five gallon jug of water on one end of the bar and a three gallon jug of oil on the other end of the bar. Um, and his legs are covered, covered in ants and he's having to do a, a five ball juggle and also the balls are on fire and he's covered in pe petrol. So unless he keeps that up, he's going to also immolate. And yes, technically, under those circumstances, you can imagine that he's very, very well motivated to run across that beam. But one mistake in any one of those things, and he's going down. And then you imagine you take the backpack off of uh, the slightly larger American tightrope walker and then put him under the same conditions as the German tightrope walker and go say, go. Um, is it any surprise that everything collapses and falls over in about five seconds flat? Matt Kidd asks, in the film Master and Commander, Mr. Allen is the only one besides the Doctor who ever pushes back against Jack's plans. What is Mr. Allen's position on the ship? What would his background be? And how does he fit into the ship's chain of command? So Mr. Allen seen here on the right is the ship's master. And in the time period that we're talking about, the ship's master is usually the senior most non-commissioned officer. Theoretically, he could ha take a commission on becoming a ship's master, um, but most of the time they weren't. And the, the position of ship's master is basically he's the one who's in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the ship. So he navigates the ship, which is uh, his primary duty, but he's also in charge of things like distributing the stores, trimming the ship, uh, raising the anchors all these kinds of things and as a result a ship's master is usually an extremely experienced mariner and uh, in Mr. Allen's case in particular as you can see he's portrayed as a somewhat older gentleman so he would have a wealth of seagoing experience behind him but within the realms of the book and the films specifically he also has local experience in the area uh, which adds to it but Effectively, a, a ship's captain could be, relatively speaking, a young officer and also obviously have, possibly having been, not specifically in the context of Master of Commander, but more generally, possibly having been promoted and being new to this particular ship, whereas the Master would know the ship inside and out. Um, although technically at the very bottom of the food chain when it came to the officers aboard the ship to not listen to a ship's master would be a fairly disastrous misstep for a captain. Um, so in some ways, similar to your kind of senior NCOs in the, the army and the land-based forces. So yeah, you might have a brand new, fresh out of the mill lieutenant or lieutenant, depending on which army you're in, who is technically in charge of the squad, but if the senior NCO, who might be twice his age, turns around and says, oh, that's a flipping stupid plan, and we probably are all going to die if we do it, if you like life, as an officer, you listen. And, you know, even, you know, in, again, looking at the, uh, at the army for an analogy, once you go beyond that, commanders, captains, colonels, etc., if they know what's good for them, will listen to the senior NCO or senior NCOs, depending on how high up the chain of command they, they are. Um, and similarly, aboard a ship, a ship's master is someone you definitely want to be listening to, and as a result, both of their experience and their knowledge will expect to be listened to within uh, certain realms of, of reasonableness. Obviously, if the captain then says, 
no, we're going to go ahead and do this, then it's yes, sir, okay, fine, we'll do our best, sir. Um, but if your ship's master has told you you're probably all going to die, you're probably all going to die. <laughs> so, yeah, may, may, maybe stop and rethink your plan. And that would be why uh, Mr. Allen, in the, particular, in the film, feels at liberty to to make the statements that he does because he, he's in charge of the ship he knows the capabilities of the surprise inside and out he has the added factor in that particular circumstance of local knowledge as well plus a wealth of of general seaborne knowledge and so he is in a position in terms of reasonable practicality to offer objections to the captain's plans even though once the captain says we're going to do this he obviously gets on with doing it Jim Smitty asks, In the past, you've said that guns and engines on ships are some of the longest lead items in shipbuilding, along with some of the most complex. Now, this has me wondering, what if some bright spark in either of the five major navies at the Washington Naval Conference realises that at the time the treaty breaks down, they're going to need something akin to the Invincible-class battlecruisers in spec, i.e. cruiser hunters, to deal with the various treaty-era cruisers that everyone's going to build? So instead of scrapping the turrets and guns, this time this bright spark finds a way to store them so that they can be reused when the time for them has come. Basically, you get a fusion of the Alaska and Vanguard in the finished ship. Could any of the five major powers in the Washington Naval Conference store enough turrets and guns to make it worth it? Would they be able to shoehorn in such a ship after the collapse of the treaty system? And if so, would they have given you useful service in World War II? Yes and no. The biggest problems you're going to have is, one, the turrets are going to be armoured like battleship turrets because they're coming from battleships, or maybe the odd battlecruiser, um, which is going to make them quite heavy for any kind of supercruiser you try and stick them on. And secondly, almost everybody is using twin turrets which is going to cause something of a problem because either you have to go with a small number of guns because you're using twin turrets um, or or you're going to have to put in lots of turrets at which point the ship that you're building is going to get exponentially larger quite quickly which is going to begin to push it towards battleship territory or at least battle cruiser territory and then that gets more problematic if you look at the five major navies, so France, Italy, Japan, the US and Britain, of the ships they're scrapping around the time of the Washington Treaty, only the Italians actually have any triple turrets on the ship or ships that they're decommissioning, that being Dante Alighieri. Um, so, in theory, if they took the triple turrets off of that, they could make themselves a faster, better armoured Deutschland alike, or, well, two actually, using the four triples, or they could make themselves probably something in the low to mid-twenties of thousands of tons, maybe using three with a two, four, one aft configuration. Um, but Italy probably also has the least need um, and the least budget to be able to afford that. Uh, the French would only have twin 12s off of some of the Corbets, the Americans, likewise, would only be able to access twin 12s from their various dreadnoughts uh, because all the 14-inch ships are still in commission. So uh, with those and the Japanese as well, because all of their 14-inch ships are either staying in commission or in Hiei's case, they're keeping the uh, machinery... Uh, sorry, they're keeping the guns to hand for refit. Or is it Harren? I can't remember. Anyway, one of the two. Um... So they'd be left with the Koachi's 12-inch guns. So you'd, you'd basically be left with a bunch of World War One vintage 12-inch guns. Now, granted, maybe you could recondition them a bit, but they're still mostly going to be 45 caliber weapons. The Americans would have some 50 cals. Um, so of those powers, the Americans would probably be in the best position because they'd have the most powerful 12-inch guns to hand, um, excluding, of course, as I said, the Italians. Um but then you have this problem of if you build a 241 aft configuration six gunner, i.e., kind of like a miniaturized Renown or Repulse, then yeah, you can take on a cruiser or deal with a cruiser quite comfortably, but it still is only a six gun armament. But if you make it an eight gun armament by putting in a fourth turret, you yeah, you'll have plenty of turrets that you can do that with. 
but now that as I say the ship is getting larger and larger at an alarming scale you'd have to ideally redevelop a new triple turret to stick the guns in um which might be doable to a certain degree but it does involve an extra step of cost um with the british they have the same problem in terms of ideally they'll want to have to try and develop a triple turret but they do have an advantage over everybody else in that they're also decommissioning a ton of 13.5 inch armed ships and a ship with six 13.5 inch guns in three twins that might actually work considering that the you know the um dunkirk and strasbourg have eight 13 inch that is actually pushing a lot closer towards be something that can comfortably deal with any reasonable number of treaty era vessels as compared to a ship that's got six 12 inch so especially if they maybe take something like the f2 battle cruiser design scale it down so you have an all forward armament three twin 13.5 inch moving at speed with sort of super cruiser grade armor yeah that might just about work but ideally again as i said you want you'd want a triple turret design if you could get away with it so storing the turrets and the guns to make it worthwhile yes you could do it um but in terms of getting such a ship built quickly after the collapse of the treaty system probably not because of the limitations of the twin turrets as i said by the time you'd sorted out by the time either you'd sorted out some kind of either f2 scale up or down actually f2 down scale or invented a new triple turret to fit the guns into you'll be into world war ii and then by the time you have finished the ship it's too late and finally trevor polisek asks could the regia marina have done anything to inhibit the allied landings on sicily would even a death ride have been enough to stop the allies in theory, yes, there's plenty the Regia Marina could have attempted to inhibit Allied landings at Sicily, but in practice it is quite limited. Um, the best they can really hope for as the Regia Marina is submarines, because those in theory might be able to sneak inside the patrolling lines of naval ships and start torpedoing transports and so forth. Destroyers wouldn't get too far there's far too many allied ships there likewise cruisers um and a death ride might accomplish something but when you add up the total number of ships available so the allies have brought w over 120 destroyers to the party so the Ita entire italian destroyer force would be massively outnumbered they've also brought 15 cruisers so by the time of operation husky the italians eh, they're not they're going to be a disadvantage facing that the allies also have two carriers uh as well as obviously land-based air support so uh attempts to coordinate with the regia Aere nautica probably won't amount to too much and then finally there are six allied battleships they're all british actually warspite valiant rodney nelson howe and king george v so you've got two modern fast battleships um, the killer of Bismarck and her sister ship, plus the the floating plot shield device and a fully modernised Queen Elizabeth. So up against that force, even if the Italians had put their entire force to sea, um, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, etc. First of all, Allied air power would have whittled them down. Then Allied aircraft carrier striking power would have whittled them down. And then finally, they would have come up against a relatively undiminished Allied force that would have a superiority in battleships, um, battleship numbers and hitting power, plus uh, superiority in cruisers. Exactly how much of superiority, obviously, depending on exactly how many the aircraft had managed to take out in ahead of time, and then an overwhelming number of destroyers. So it would have certainly disrupted things because the Allies aren't going to be stupid. They're not going to just randomly continue the landings whilst the entire Regia Marina is bearing down on them so it would have disrupted the landings as the troop transports withdrew and the various naval forces consolidated themselves for battle but um, yeah it would have been a glorious fight for the Regia Marina and indeed something they were preparing to do at the time the Italian surrender order came through albeit by that point the Allies had landed on mainland Italy um, 
but also something that ultimately you wouldn't have stopped the landing. And that brings us to the end of this week's video. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, no particular channel admin for this week, um, just things going on as usual. With just one minor note that you may have seen various videos from a few different uh, YouTubers recently, especially those in the military history um, and historical generally um, vicinity, mentioning that YouTube seems to have it out for them and views are being curtailed and diminished beyond what they rightfully should. Um, and, you know, videos that should generate a lot of interest aren't because of various shenanigans with YouTube systems. Uh, th this channel's not been as affected by those, but I would definitely lend my voice to saying that this is definitely a thing that is happening. Um, more, most particularly, I think, if I was going to point to any one video, it would be the one from the, the first one from the America Tour on USS Constitution. There were all sorts of weird and wonderful things going on with the with YouTube analytics during the first few hours of that video being live which um, I think compared to where it probably would have gone otherwise somewhat crippled its numbers um, I'm not unhappy with the video um, it, it's performed well enough but yeah some something's definitely up with YouTube playing funny games with its historic based content creators but uh, c'est la vie, and uh, onwards we go. Now, hopefully, uh, some of you understand why people um, on YouTube end up having to take sponsorships, because that's kind of a cushion against YouTube playing stupid games. Um, although, as, as before, as I said, I remain committed to um, only taking sponsorships that have some degree of relevance to the channel. Uh, I'm not just going to be taking sponsorships left, right and centre, so hopefully the ones that I have taken so far uh, you found fairly acceptable. And with that said, uh, see you all again in another video.